Good morning, this is Pastor Ron, and I'm certainly glad to be with you. I so appreciate when we can get together and meet on Sunday, but I also so appreciate when we can get together over the internet. It's so good to be together. It's so good to know that when the Lord is with us in a very special way, when we gather together in his name. And if you've been with us as we've gathered together over the last month or so, you know we've been engaged in a character study on a person whose name was Job. And Job certainly went through a lot of things. And as we studied his life, we tried to ask and answer certain questions. We tried to ask and answer how should we best respond when things that are already hard become worse. We tried to ask and answer how you help a hurting friend. We tried to ask and answer how to handle things when everything inside of us wants to just ebb and flow in the wrong direction instead of going in the right direction. And today we're going to be talking about how to deal with the why questions, which are perhaps the most powerful and personal ones at all. If you've been with us for some time, you know that it's not uncommon for me to say, God is stronger than anything or anyone we ever face. I love to cite 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, when talking about dealing with the spirits that are in this world. And there are a lot of spirits in this world. What does John say as he's moved by God's Holy Spirit? He says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them, everything else that comes your way, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who who is in the world. What a comforting truth to know that when we have Jesus Christ in our hearts, the one who is within us, Jesus Christ, is stronger than anything or anyone we will ever encounter. But that's not the only comforting verse in the Bible. I love to read James chapter 5, verse 16, which tells us that the prayer of a righteous man, the prayer of a righteous person, is powerful and effective. And I've lived long enough to know that that's true. When someone is really into God, when when someone really walks with God and they pray, their prayers make a wonderful difference. And I also love to read when I'm going through a difficult time, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. That writer tells us that when we are believers and we're going through difficult times, that God sends ministering spirits to us known as angels that serve to help us under the direction of God himself. Yet, and it's a powerful yet, it's a personal yet, it's a, potent, it's a potent yet, yet what do we know? We know that our prayer list continues to grow. That's right, our prayer list continues to grow. Why is that? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever thought that? Have you ever prayed about that? Why is it that our prayer list continues to grow? Now, people of faith have struggled with that particular question from the time of Adam and Eve into the present. Yes, we're aware of the fact that we live on a sin-scarred earth. We know that for sure, and we know that for certain. However, we still find ourselves perplexed. We still find ourselves really struggling when great challenges come our way, and we often find ourselves, as a result of facing great challenges, asking not only ourselves and each other, but even Jesus why. You know what I mean. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? Why did this have to happen to us? Why did this have to happen to me? Some time ago, I talked with you about when I was a young man, and I was in my first church serving as associate pastor, and I was very close to a lot of the people there. And One of the people who I was really close to was a man by the name of Leonard Silver, and he was our college Sunday school class, and he knew the Bible really well, and he had just an amazing wisdom that God had blessed upon him, and many people, when talking about him, would refer to him as the sage of the South. And I remember there was a time in my life when I had a lot of personal why questions and I tried to figure them out on my own and I decided one day that maybe a better thing to do is be able to spend some time talking to Leonard, the sage of the South, about some of the personal questions and why questions that I had. Well, I went over there and if you know me, you know I'm filled with a lot of emotion and when I went over there, I just poured out my heart to him, to all the different things that were running through my mind and running through my heart. And when I finally stopped, I'll never forget what he did. He said, Ron, I appreciate your praying. I, Ron, I appreciate your coming to me. Ron, I appreciate the fact that you've opened yourself up so much for me. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to pray for you. Did I appreciate the fact that he listened to me? Absolutely. Did I appreciate the fact that he told me he was going to pray for me? There's no doubt about that. But to be honest with you and to be honest with him, I said to him, you know, Leonard, I, I really do appreciate the fact that we're meeting together and that you're willing to pray for me. But could you give me just a little bit more insight about what you think I should do with some of these why questions? 
But after I said that, he had a little bit more to say, and he said something that at the time really caught me off guard. He said, Ron, have you ever considered the fact that the answers to your questions are not any of your own business? Now, at that time, when I'm a young man, I'm in my early 20s, Hearing that the things in my life aren't any of my business, that was hard for me to hear. I couldn't even begin to comprehend that. And I thought, how can anything that has to do with my personal life be not any of my business? That's how I felt then. But boy, I certainly don't feel that way now. In fact, I wholeheartedly agree with his assertion now. And let me tell you why. Because I know what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that my life does not belong to me. When I met Christ and gave my life over to Christ, my life was bought. It was purchased by the precious, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and it no longer belongs to me. But that's not the only thing that I know. I know that the Bible teaches some significant truths that I need to always remember, but especially remember when I'm dealing with the why questions. I want you to see some of the passages that deal with the why questions that we hold so deeply inside our hearts. Go with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, look with me at chapter 13, Verse 12. Now, there's an awful lot of things that are going on in Corinth. They had their ups. They had their downs. They were just like any other Christians. They had their struggles. They had their victories. They had their defeats, and there's no doubt about that. And after addressing a lot of the problems that they had in First and in Second Corinthians, Paul's moved to the Spirit to write something very powerful in First Corinthians chapter 12. Look what he says. He says, now, now, the now that he's talking about is, well, we are on earth. Well, while we're living on earth, we see but a poor reflection as as in a mirror. But then the next word he says is then. And what's he talking about when he says then? He says, then when I'm with the Lord, we will see face to face. He says, now, as long as I'm here on this earth, I know in part there are some things I know and there are a lot of things that I don't know. In fact, there's probably a whole lot more things that I don't know than what I do know. But then when I'm with the Lord, I shall know fully even as I am fully known. What is the Apostle Paul telling us? He's telling us, someday you're going to understand everything, but that day is not going to come until you are with the Lord. I love how the, the King James Bible translates this particular verse. It says, now I see through a dark glassly. And in other words, there are times that we can perceive, but we can't perceive fully what's really going on, and we will never be able to see fully what's going on until we are with the Lord. And that should not surprise us because what did Moses say in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29? It says, he said that the secret things belong to God, but he didn't stop talking there. He also went on to say these words, but the things that belong to us, been revealed to us, are for us to teach our children forever that we may all follow the words of this law. So who do the secret things belong to in this world? They belong to God. And he may or he may not reveal those things to us. I've seen people, and perhaps you have as well, who have wasted, if not ruined their lives, trying to understand the inexplicable. That is not a wise thing to do. It's a very foolish thing to do. Yet that's not the only thing that Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29 tells us. It also teaches us that there are some things that God has revealed to us that we have been had revealed to us so we can teach them, not just to ourselves, but teach us to their children so we can all collectively with our children, with our grandchildren, better walk and follow with him. Therefore, it's not wrong to have a discussion about the wise. It's not wrong to pray about the wise. It only becomes wrong when we obsess with the wise and let our questions ruin, if not waste, our lives. This morning, I feel led to do just that, to very specifically address some of the wise. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll dig in. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you know our hearts. You know when we're struggling. You know when we have questions. We know when our questions have questions. You know when we're, we're torn asunder. We know when our minds or our hearts and our spirits are divided. And Father, we pray that through divine insight, we'd be able to glean some of your promises and gather some of your answers. Recognize we'll never have all the answers until we're with you. But Lord, we do want to take the things that have been revealed to us and remember them ourselves and teach them to those who come behind us so that we can all best follow you. For we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a young man, one of the books that I read that really taught me a lot 
was a book by Viktor Frankl. If you're not familiar with him, let me tell you a little bit about Viktor Frankl. He was a Jewish psychiatrist, and during World War II, the Nazis came and they grabbed him, and they stripped him of every single thing that he owned except for his clothing. Even the manuscript that was inside of the lining of his coat was taken away. When talking about what happened, Frankl said these words. He said, I found myself confronted with the question other wonder whether under such circumstances my life was ultimately void of any meaning. A few days later, when still wrestling with that question, the Nazis came to him again, and this time they took his clothes and they, just, they gave him the clothes of a prisoner who was taken to a gas chamber, and when he went into the pocket of the newfound coat that he'd been given, he said, instead of finding the manuscript that I had been working on for a really long time, I found only one piece of paper, and the one piece of paper was the prayer, the prayer called Shema Israel, and this prayer states these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Frankel, when talking about this, said, how should I interpret such a coincidence, and he puts coincidence in quotes, except for as a challenge to myself to live my thoughts instead of merely putting them on paper. Years later, when he talked about the entire ordeal and he wrote his classic work, Man's Search for Meaning, he said these words. He said, there's nothing in the world that would so effectively help one survive, even the worst of conditions, as the knowledge that there is meaning in one's life. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any hell. You hear those words again? He said, there's nothing in the world that would so effectively help one survive, even the worst conditions, as the knowledge that there's meaning in one's life. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. Victor Frankl's words echo a biblical truth we've talked about time and time again, especially when we were reading the book of First Peter and making our way through that in a verse-by-verse -verse journey. We as Christians know that we have a why to live for. That why is a precious thing. Remember what we talked about when we were studying 1 Peter? We saw that what the Lord placed within us at the time of our salvation matters far more than anything that would ever happen to us. I believe that with all my heart. We have a why to live for, but we don't just have a why to live for, we have a who to live for. Again, remember 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, which tells us that the one who is in us, who's that? Jesus Christ is greater than the one who is in the world. So we have a why to live for, we have a who to live for, and it's the God of all creation, Jesus Christ. I also I'd like to remember what we saw in Peter when we read 1 Peter in chapter 5, verse 10, which tells us in the God of all grace, who called us to eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, will himself, he's going to do this himself, do what? Restore you, make you strong, firm, and, and steadfast. Amen to that. We won't be suffering forever. Someday. Some glad and glorious day, our troubles and trials will flee away and we will be with Christ for a time that knows no end. Now it seems at the end of Job's testing, it would be rather obvious for him to say, Amen, which means it's so, it's true. For a very long time, he had absolutely no clue as to why he was suffering and he certainly never understood at all. And we don't know those things either. On this uncharted earth, we're going to have questions, and some of those questions will never be answered until we get the glory itself. For quite a while, Job was an absolute picture of patience. You know that people often talk about the patience of Job. However, there came a time in his life when his patience ran out, and he sought to challenge God, saying that he actually wanted to take God to court. Can you imagine? That's how upset he was. He says, I'm going to take God to court. And if you go to chapter 38, you'll see that God took him up on that challenge, and he spoke to Job out of a storm, the Bible tells us. And as he's speaking to him, when you read the passages, you see that he asked him 70 questions concerning the creation and the management of the things that God does, and none of those things Job was able to answer at all. And through the barrage of questions, Job realized something really important. He realized that, he realized that challenging God was not only presumptuous, it was very, very foolish. And this change of heart and this change of attitude is reflected in his words in chapter 42, and I want you to see him. 
Look how it begins in verses 1 through 6. Then, now stop. This is right after all the challenges. Then, after taking God to court, after having God ask him questions that he couldn't answer, what happens next? Job replied to the Lord, I know you can do how many things? I know you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I cannot understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, did Job see God with his physical eyes? No, he didn't see him with his physical eyes, but he did see him with, faith, with eyes of faith. And he did see them with his spiritual eyes, and that gave him great understanding. And because this was true, he accepted God's plan in his life, but he did more than just accept it. What did he do? He repented in dust and ashes, a sign of humility and a sign of deep respect. After Job's confession, what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us that the Lord himself reprimanded the three friends of Job for misrepresenting them, and he told them that they had to give him a significant sacrifice. And then we see that Job found a place in his heart, not just for to repent about the things he had done wrong, but even some of the things that he had talked about with his, his friends that weren't right. And he forgave his friends and then went on to pray for them. And how did the Lord respond when he saw Job do all these things and make the right steps? Well, look with me in verses 10 through 17, where we read, After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter was named Jemima, the second one Keziah, and the third one Karen Habuch. Nowhere in all the land were their women found as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation, and so he died old and full of years. Wow, we have talked a lot about Job. And we've talked openly and honestly about some of the things he faced and some of the ways he responded. And when I think about what took place in the book of Job, I'm reminded of some very powerful truths. And the first powerful truth I'm reminded of is this. This earth is not heaven. This earth is not heaven. That being so, what else do we know is a truth that is just for sure truth that we can never deny? We will not be spared from pain and struggles in this life. Yes, there's going to be times in your life and in my life that are going to be difficult. Yes, there's going to be times in your life and my life that are going to be very hurtful. Yes, there's going to be times in your life and my life when we're going to have to deal with some very harsh things that happen to us. There's no doubt about that. And there's no doubt about that, the fact that that's going to take place. And there's also no doubt about the fact that not everybody has a happy ending on earth like Job. But his story reminds us of a very important truth we do well to always remember. And the truth is this. God has a greater purpose when he allows his people to face adversity. We hear that again. God has a greater purpose when he allows his people to face adversity. Let me be specific. I have prayed and I have thought a lot about how to address some of the wise. And there have been nine things that the Lord has placed within my heart that I feel led to share with you about why God allows us to face certain kinds of struggle, certain kinds of pain, certain kinds of hardship. The first thing that came to my mind that I felt led to share with you is this. I believe that God allows us to face adversity because it causes us to find new meaning in his word. You hear that again? God allows us to face adversity because it causes us to find new meaning in his word. Isn't it fair to say that some of the more treasured verses we have in the God, God's word take on new meaning and give us hope and comfort in the times of great difficulty? 
You know what I mean? In the midst of great suffering, we find so much comfort in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, which tells us that our suffering isn't going to last forever. In times of suffering, we're drawn back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, where we read, Greater is the one who is in us than the one who is in the world. When someone we love passes away, we find great comfort in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, which tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In the times of great suffering, we want to read about the promises of peace and endurance and courage and we especially want to read about those things when we're more than a little bit tempted to be overwhelmed depleted or fearful what's the first reason that i believe god allows us to go through difficult times it's because adversity causes us to find new meaning in his word but that's not the only thing that I feel led to share with you. Let me share with you a second thing. Adversity in our lives can inspire others to have more faith. Life is not just all about us. When we go through adversity, sometimes those are the opportunities that we have before us to be able to inspire others to have more faith. The other day I talked to a woman who told me that she met two of her deceased husband's friends after not seeing them for a really long time. When describing what passed through her mind and heart when she saw them, she said the first thought that passed through her mind was she just wished that her husband was still alive, and she shared with God that in prayer. Why is it that my husband had to pass away? Here are two of his friends, and yet my husband passed away. Sometime later, she felt like the Lord answered her question, saying, If you still had your old life, you wouldn't be as close to me as you are right now. I get that, and I'm sure you do as well. Adversity can draw us to God like nothing else I know. And when we overcome it through his strength, it serves as a powerful witness and encouragement to others to demonstrate more faith themselves. There is no greater opportunity for us to be a witness of the love and goodness of God than in times of our own personal struggle. If you've been a Christian for a long time, I'm sure that at one time or another, your faith was strengthened by a faithful sufferer. You've seen people who are bearing great burdens who yield great blessings. Do you remember what we talked about a number of months ago? I was telling you about a lady who was in a nursing home and she was confined to her bed and she was going through such a difficult time and people would wonder all the time after going through all that she did how she could possibly have so much joy and so much peace in her heart and they, they wondered how that could possibly be and one of the ones who wondered about it the most was her pastor and after visiting her for week after week, year after year, he went up to her one day and he said, I just want to ask you a question and I hope that I'm being, not being too forward. He said, how do you ask? so much joy in your life how do you have so much purpose in your life how come you seem to be such a grateful person and she said these words to him she said when life gives you lemons either you can suck them for the rest of your life or you can make lemonade i choose to make lemonade let me talk let me talk at a deep and personal level it's a good day in our lives when we choose to make lemonade and make no mistake about it it is a powerful witness. This is what Jesus was referring to when he was asked by his disciples, why was this man born blind? And he answered that question saying, his, he didn't sin and neither did his parents sin. This man was born blind. Why? So that the power of God could be shown. Think about some of the examples we know more currently about people who went through different kinds of troubles and yet they overcame. How about Billy Graham with his Parkinson's disease? How about Corey Ten Boom and her prison camp experience? What about Johnny Erickson Tata, who for years, not only years, but decades has been paralyzed? Yes, faithful people, when they deal with adversity in a Christ-like way, inspires us to have more faith ourselves. Why does sometimes God allow his people to have adversity? Because it gives us the opportunity to be a better witness, and in so doing, we inspire other people to have more faith themselves. But the Lord put another one in my heart I want to share with you. Third, adversity makes us more compassionate towards those who are hurting. If you ever really struggled, truly struggled, what have you seen take place in your life? All of a sudden, you look at everything differently. And you especially look at people differently. You know what I mean? You see the person within the people. And when you see the person within the people, what does it do? It, can, it spurs you on to be compassionate. Now think with me. 
think with me, who can best minister to parents who have lost a child in death? Isn't it fair to say that the one who can best do that is the one who's walked that trail themselves? Who can best be with somebody and help them when they found out that they've got cancer in their body? Isn't it fair to say it's somebody who also has walked that trail where there's been cancer in their body? Who can help someone who's hurting and lost their job or who has a wayward child? Isn't it fair to say that it's the person who's had these things happen in their own life? Nothing, no thing softens the heart and tempers the temper like adversity. The Bible, when it teaches us to be a good steward, tells us to be not just a good steward of our possessions. That's difficult, but there's something even greater that he wants us to be a good, a, a good steward of. He wants us to be a good steward of our pain. Now, you don't hear that every day. So let me say it to you again. The scripture teaches us not just to be a good steward of our possessions. It teaches us to be a good steward of our pain. And that only happens if we take the heart from what Paul had to say to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, which talks about how God has comforted us. And he's comforted us not just because he loves us and he cares about us, but he's also comforted us so that we would do what? So that we would make the choice to comfort other people in the same way that God has comforted us. What are you saying, Pastor Ron? I'm saying don't ever forget that adversity makes a person more compassionate and makes them want to come to the aid of other people who are hurting. But that's not the only thing that God shared with me to share with you. And let me give you a fourth thing. Adversity causes us to re-examine our priorities. You know what I mean? It changes our minds about what's really important in life. It tells us to focus on the things that really do count, that really do matter. It reminds us of a truth we need to hold in our hearts every single day of our life. It's found in James chapter 4, verse 14, where James, our Lord's half-brother, says, Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? Not just other people's life, but what is your life? You, not just other people, you are a mist. You're a vapor, you're a puff of smoke that appears for a little while and then passes away or vanishes. When you take those words to heart, when you seek to redeem or make the best use of the time that you've been blessed with instead of wasting it on things that are stolen, rusted, or fade away, it is a good day in your life. And that's another thing that adversity does. It causes us to re-examine our priority. But again, it doesn't stop there. And let me share with you a fifth thing. Adversity accelerates our spiritual growth. That's true, isn't it? Adversity accelerates our spiritual growth. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the disciples grew more in the storm on the Sea of Galilee? Or do you think that they grew more after months and months of teaching? Well, it certainly seems to me that they grew more when they were in that storm in the Sea of Galilee. What did they do after that? They worshipped him. They recognized him as being the Christ. And what's true for them is true for us. The storms of life give us the opportunity to really grow. And that should not surprise us because they give us the opportunity to glean something more than just having knowledge. They give us the opportunity to glean having wisdom. They help us understand that the maturity of a Christian is measured not by how long they've come to church, how long they've known the Lord, even how many times they've read the Bible or even prayed. It's measured by the degree of the fruit of spirit of the spirit being made evident in their life that they have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness goodness faithfulness and self-control that's that is what it means to be a mature Christian. And when you walk with someone who's gone through great adversity, you know what they also start to define very differently? They start defining love very differently too. That's a good thing. Adversity accelerates our spiritual growth. Let me give you a sixth thing. Adversity makes us humble. When we come to the fact that we're temporal, when we come to, when we come to the fact that we recognize that we have feet of clay, it's amazing how much the arrogance is drained out of our life. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. We stop from being so caught up in the I and me syndrome. We stop just looking in the mirror and seeing only ourselves. And isn't it fair to say that no one can really come to the Lord, at least fully come to the Lord, until they have made the choice to come to the end of their selves. You've heard me say this before, but please hear it again. So many times when we're going through life, whether it's a good time or a bad time, we only 
look up after we've looked down and look left and look right. We only look up after we've looked down, we've looked left, we look right. Who doesn't need to look up more? Who doesn't need to look down less? Who doesn't need to look less to the left and the right and to come to God first and to ask him to be the loudest voice in their life? Yes, adversity is hard, but it makes us more humble, and that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Three more. Seventh, adversity builds our character. Like nothing else I know, it reminds us there is no gain without some pain. Paul talked about that, didn't he? He said, I want to know Christ, not only in the power of his resurrection, but also in his suffering. Wow, that's quite a statement, isn't it? A wise person once said these words. He said, life is a grindstone. Whether it grinds you down or polishes you up depends on what you choose to be made of. Wow, what's he talking about? He's talking about character. Character is more important than charisma. Character is more important than reputation. Character is more important than comfort. And what brings about character more than anything else? All of us know. It's adversity. It's adversity. Adversity builds our character. Eighth, adversity makes heaven more attractive. Amen to that. The scripture teaches that as long as we're on earth, we're still to have our hearts live in heaven and all of us know that's not an easy thing to do because we get caught up with the temporary we get sidetracked from the eternal and we think about so many things that don't matter that much and we do much better to think about eternity and being with the Lord forever in heaven one of the people who I like to follow is a man by the name of D.O. Moody and when he learned of the death of his dear dear friend Henry Drummond he said these words he said the home going of Drummond adds one more great attraction to heaven I get that and I'm sure you do as well and let me give you a final thing that the Lord put in my heart to share with you if you've ever been to the place where Christ is all that you really have you discover that he is all that you really need. Will you hear that again? If you've ever been to the place where Christ is all that you really have, you find out he is all that you really need. Now you don't hear that every day, so let me drive that home with a wonderful poem written by a woman named April Lawyer, and the poem is entitled, To Know Me Is The Greatest Gift. Listen to it with not just your ears, but listen to it with your heart, listen to it with your soul, listen to it with your spirit, and ask the Lord if there's something you need to glean from her words. Here's how she begins. Desperately, helplessly, longingly I cried, quietly, patiently, lovingly God replied, I pled and I wept for a clue to my fate, and the master who said, gently, child, you must wait. Wait, you say, wait, my indignant replied. Lord, I need answers, I need to know why. Is your hand shortened, or have you not heard? By faith I have asked, and I'm claiming your word. My future and all that I can relate hangs in the balance, and you tell me to wait? I'm needing a yes, a go-ahead sign, or even a no to which I can resign. And Lord, you promised if we but believe, we need to but ask and we will receive. Lord, I've been asking, and this is my cry. I'm weary, I'm weary of asking. I need a reply. Then quietly, softly, I learned of my fate. As my master replied, once again, you must wait. So I slumped in my chair, defeated and tout, and grumbled to God. So I'm waiting for what? He seemed then to kneel, and his eyes wept with mine, and he tenderly said, I could give you a sign. I could shake the heavens and darken the sun. I could raise the dead and cause the mountains to run. All this you seek I could give, and pleased you would be. You would have what you want, but you wouldn't want and know me. You wouldn't know the depth of my love for each saint. You wouldn't know the joy of resting in me. You'd never experience that fullness of love as the peace of my spirit descends like a dove. You'd know that I live and I save for a start, but you wouldn't know the depth of the beat of my heart, the glow of my comfort late in the night, the faith that, that I give when you walk without sight, the depth that's beyond getting just what you asked of an infinite God who makes what you have last. You'd never know should your pain quickly flee 
what it means that my grace is sufficient for thee. Yes, your dream for your loved one overnight would come true, but oh, the loss if I lost what I'm doing to you. So be silent, my child, and in time you will see that the greatest of gifts is to know me. And though often my answers seem terribly awake, my most precious answer of all is still wait. Waiting's hard, isn't it? Always has been. And when I think about all that this poem says, a lot of different things come to me, but the first thing that comes to me are the words of the psalmist in Psalms 46, verse 10, which tells us, Be still and know that I am God. What does that mean? It means only in the stillness do we even begin to know what it means to know God is God. Victor Franco, when he spoke about going through a difficult times, said, He who has a why to live for can bear almost any hell. Whether he knew it or not, he was echoing a biblical truth. These nine things that the Lord put in my heart to share with you are some of the answers to some of our why questions. Yet, let me quickly add that on this earth, we will never have the answers to all of our questions. Until then, we're wise to take comfort in the words of Jesus in John chapter 13, verse 7. Let me give you the context. Jesus is speaking to Peter and he wants to wash his feet and Peter is resistant. And the Lord says to him, you do not realize what I am doing now, but later you will understand. You do not realize what I'm doing now. But later you'll understand, and when you do, you'll understand it forever. Those words are true beyond our comprehension at this point. Some of our whys in this life will be answered. Some of our whys will be answered in the days and in the years ahead. And some of the why questions that we ask will never be fully answered until we get to heaven. But let me tell you what will happen when we get there. When we get there, the veil is pulled back. And like Job, you know what we'll do? We'll declare that God had a greater purpose when he allowed us to face suffering. And when everything's sung and everything's happened, all the dust is settled, I believe that's the best way to address the wise of life. So trust in God's love and in God's care. Trust in God's sovereignty. Make that the anchor of your life, that you trust the hand and heart of God. And especially remind yourself of it in the midst of addressing the whys that come your way. May God bless you. That's his desire. But you have to let him be the Lord. You need to have him have the final word, the loudest voice, and give your questions to him. And sometimes leave them there, not just get caught up in them in a way that you never go forward. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're a great and personal God. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you and have our chains be broken. We thank you, Lord, that you hear the heart pleas that we give to you. And we thank you, Lord, that you invite the questions. Some things happen and we understand sometime later why. Some things happen and we understand right away why. Some things we will never know until glory. But Father, when we trust your love and care, and we make the sovereignty of God the anchor of our life, and we recognize that we are not going to suffer forever, we'll be done with the troubles of trials someday, and we'll be with you forever. May we remember, Lord, that you have a greater purpose. May we remember your heart. May we seek to trust you, even when we don't understand, particularly when we're trying to answer the why questions of life. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.